Hi, I'm Nancy Blotner. At Caldwell University, we believe that all citizens should be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, Hackensack Meridian Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, dedicated to saving lives through organ and tissue donation, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, the Northward Center, and by NJM Insurance Group. Promotional support provided by HipNewJersey.com. Live hard, work hard, play hard. You're from New Jersey, and so are we. And by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands. This is One on One. I'm an equal American just like you are. The jobs of tomorrow are not the jobs of yesterday. Look at this. You, you got it this? Back. Here it is, man. Look at that. Life without dance is boring. <laughs> I don't care how good you are or how good you think you are, there is always something to learn. Do you enjoy talking politics? No. People call me because they feel nobody's paying attention. Our culture, I don't think, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. That's a good question. High five. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. I'm in Atlantic City, New Jersey. This is the 164th New Jersey Education Association Convention. We're in Convention Center. I'll tell you what, for the next half hour, here's what you're going to see. We're speaking to educators, leaders of the NJEA, educational innovators, people who are talking about science, technology, um, the arts, music, language, all different folks who are here at this convention. Happens over two days every year. And people say, what goes on in Atlantic City at the NJA convention? For the next half hour, you're about to find out a big part of it is about collaboration, about teachers coming together, sharing ideas, how to be the best classroom teachers they can be. And uh, it's a half an hour you simply can't afford to miss. We are honored to be joined by the president of the NJA, Marie Bliston. Marie, you taught for a few years? Yeah, well over 30 years. Where? Yep. I taught in Somerdale in Camden County. I taught in Sterling High School, and then I went over to Washington Township in Gloucester County. Why'd you get into teaching? To help students. Uh, when I was in high school, I found that I loved history, social studies, and I loved the Spanish language, neither of which I'm certified in today. Is that right? But Yeah, but I loved it, and I started to think about going into teaching because I liked my teachers. Uh, and then a, a student from Italy came over into our high school, and I did not speak Italian, but he spoke no English, and he was struggling. And one of my teachers asked me, out of the blue, if I would help him. And uh, I did, and I found I loved it. And when I got into college, and I went to Camden County College, I'm a cr proud graduate of the county colleges, I uh, worked, and I got introduced in the summertime to students who were physically, emotionally, and psychologically challenged. Uh, it was called Camp Happy Times, and it was right in Atco, New Jersey. And I fell in love with those kids. And I switched immediately to stop thinking about teaching history and uh, Spanish and teaching children, those children who I thought needed me most. You know, fast forward a little bit. Yep. As the president yes. of this organization, with, I believe 200,000 yes. members, yes. describe that responsibility. It's huge. It's not just 200,000 members. It is 200,000 families. It's over a million children in our public schools, and it's their families. That's the responsibility I look at. Is it personal for you? Very personal, yes. Why, how? It's a passion. I, I truly believe that there is no greater profession in this world, uh, on this earth, except for being a parent. For, because of the impact that we have, the opportunity that we have to help shape someone's life, to make it better, and to make the world better. You know, often the, our members, we don't really see the fruits of our labor. We mm. see them during that year, or even during a, if they're K to eight, or through the high school. But they go on into life and into society, mm. and they become and do all kinds of great things. You know, the NJA is such a powerful force. I was talking to your executive director, Ed Richardson, yes. about this. 
Being involved in the political process mm -hmm. is a necessity for the NJA? Absolutely. It, yeah. Make the case. Well, we are public employees, and as public employees, we depend on public funds. And those public funds are overseen by elected officials. And we need to make sure that we are the priority. Again, because I don't think that there is any greater charge in this earth than working with children and providing for them. There'll be a new governor. Yes. Um, well, the show will be seen as we move into 2018. Phil Murphy will be the governor um, of the great state of New Jersey. You say what to that? I say we are thrilled. Uh, he has come to us. He's he was come, here at the convention. He was here at the convention this morning. He thanked us. He talked about the great things that he was going to do because he knows that public education is the cornerstone of this democracy, of this country, and of this state. Mm. Number one issue in 2018 from your perspective, on behalf of the teachers, the educators, public school educators in the state would be? Well, I think first we have to make sure that we recognize it's not just teachers. 200,000 employees of our support professionals are as equal to us as the certified and the active. And don't forget our retirees. We have almost 30,000 of our retirees. So all the issues that affect them and public education is it will be number one. Where does, Phil, where, where well, is, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, Phil noted in his uh, remarks this morning. You're on a first name basis with the governor. I just I want to say certainly, that. Certainly, <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, I am. And I am proud to call him ambassador and now governor yes, elect. Go let me ahead. tell you. Uh, he noted that school funding was going to be right at the top of his list, and I absolutely support that. We've been underfunded over $9 billion, and that uh, has a residual effect, not just in our classrooms, in our schools. When I saw arts programs cut, when I saw physical education cut, when I go into buildings, uh, Stephen, I don't see a school nurse in every single building. I am upset, I'm bothered. When I see school facilities that have been underfunded and are falling apart, that is just unacceptable. Because of economics. Because of, uh, absolutely. So when he puts that down as number one, nine billion dollars over these many years that it's been underfunded, I absolutely support him because I know that there are going to be a lot of residuals that are going to be seen right into our classrooms, our school buses, our cafeterias. Let me ask you about uh, morale of teachers. I'm curious about this. I mean, the teachers that we interact with in the mm -hmm. public schools in Montclair, um, thank you, by the way, for everything you've done for our children. Unless I'm not reading it right, they, they pretty much seem upbeat, positive, love their job, but I know that can't be the totality of the profession. How do you fight against, dare I call it, teacher burnout? Well, there are a lot of reasons for teacher burnout. And, you know, it comes down again to whether we're holding the profession as a priority in our community and in our state. Do they have the resources they need to get through the day? And I think, again, over the last eight years, the attacks that we have been under, verbal attacks, uh, attacks that were physical in that they withheld funding for our public schools, it starts to wear and tear on our members. How, but how, Excuse me, how about standardized tests? Yes. Add to it? No. Add to it? it no. Does? No, it's overused and no, it's no, no, abused. No, 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 meaning add to the frustration for some yeah, teachers? Yeah, absolutely. Explain that to folks. Because, again, I've been in the classroom well over 30 years. I've had kindergarten through 12th grade students over that time. There is absolutely a need and a place for standardized testing and for regular testing. What is the place? It's, the place is to measure a student uh, where he or she is at that moment in time and then to use it diagnostically to see what else we need to do to move that student forward. Uh, it has taken a far right turn or a turn Overused. over overused and misused, right? It's not its not the sum total of a student. We're not measuring on a standardized test a student's ability to play music or to draw art. What are we measuring we, through these tests? We are measuring, well, we are not measuring students learning on that test. That much I will tell you. That much I will and so tell you. So what message is there for parents like myself, my wife? Like we say, okay, you gotta take the test. You gotta get ready for the test. Yeah. Well, that's why it's got to be done. It's the law. 
Well, until we change the law, right? Until we get legislators in place who understand what the place is of testing and are there to support this profession and to support their children. But you're saying it's really not the best way to measure where our young, our, stu our own kids, students, children are. If it's being used as the only way, it is wrong. It is downright wrong. That's correct. How much you love what you do as the president of the NJA? Steve, I am a teacher. Uh, my parents were, I was the only female in my family that went to college, that went to four years, got a master's degree. I was the first female in my family. Uh, my father came from an immigrant family over from Italy. So they were very, very proud of my teaching career. And, and whenever anyone asks what I do, the first thing I say is I'm a teacher. And I am equally as proud to represent the members in this profession and to be the president of the association. But I will also tell you that I teach every single day. Thank, thank you for you. having us here. No, thank you. Okay. Yes. To watch more one on one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Here we are at the 2017 New Jersey Education Association convention. Of all the people, I'm going to hurt other people. I don't mean to. I don't mean to offend you, but I really, really wanted to meet this young lady right here. She is Amy Anderson, the 2017 through 2018 New Jersey State Teacher of the Year. What an honor. American Sign Language teacher at Ocean City High School. Congratulations, Amy. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right, real quick. When you found out that you were the Teacher of the Year, what was your first reaction? Uh, just shock. Just shock. Um, and excitement, I think, because as Teacher of the Year, I represent all of the teachers throughout New Jersey, but also as an American Sign Language teacher and member of the deaf community. It's an opportunity to represent deaf culture, to represent my students who find this passion in American Sign Language mm. and um, promote that awareness as well. Explain the actual teaching, the, the, the process of teaching sign language. Okay, so I use an immersion method. Um, in my classroom, we don't use our voices, so maybe the first day, first couple of days. Then all in. Yeah, then we're all in. That's what immersion and, means. Yeah, and they they can do it. They don't believe it at first, the ASL ones, but they, um, yeah, we do. I teach them some survival signs at first, in case they have to go to the bathroom, get a drink, whatever it is, and then we're just full steam ahead, and they are amazing, what these kids can do. I mean, why is it so important for students, for, for all of us? to know how to sign? ASL is the third or fourth biggest language or most used language in the United States. We have um, a deaf community that, although if we put all of the deaf people in one place would be small, is really spread out all over the country. And what's really exciting that's happened in Ocean City is with all of the students learning how to sign, um, Ocean City has become known as a deaf-friendly town. A so, deaf-friendly deaf town. Friendly town. So um, when deaf people come to Ocean City, it's a big tourist attraction. They're walking on the boardwalk. They're shopping on Asbury Avenue. Place. Yeah. There are students who are signing with them. So at first, they were just like, oh my gosh, here's you know somebody that can sign. And now it's very commonplace. So I think that feeling of comfort, of just natural, here's this other language, um, the more that could be widespread, you know, better for another community that's part of all of us. One of the things that struck me as I was looking at the notes, it said that you really want to take on the perceptions that some have, whether, I don't, know, I don't want to use the word prejudice, but the misconceptions of those who are dealing with deafness. Correct, so really the first day of my class, I tackle this. Um, I use, diverse, well, I use diversity jelly beans so the flavor does not match the color. And so right away I want my students to know that culture and language are connected and um, that we're going to talk about stereotypes. We're going to talk about what is the stereotype? assumptions. On the so, part of some, not all. I, I hate when people say stereotypes in the sense that everyone looks at it that way. That's not true. Right. Many, some do. Go ahead. Um, so. What I will ask the groups of students to do is, in a you know, have a conversation. Um, are deaf people a disabled group or are they a cultural group? And 
nine times out of ten, most of the students, unless they have a sibling who took my class and know what I want them to say, will say it's a disabled group. And then I tell them by December, when you're taking midterms, you're going to be able to tell me why all of the reasons why the deaf community is a culture with a shared language, a shared history, arts and literature, poetry, theater, um, and just to shift the perception of here's this group that I thought was disabled or lesser than, and now looking at the richness of how it can enrich my life, and then I want them to turn that to themselves, where often they're feeling less than those around them. It's not a disability, is it? No, it, it really is where not. Where the heck did we get that? Well. Anybody who's different, I think, um, or a smaller minority culture within the majority culture. The majority culture always thinks that the minority culture wants to be like them yeah. and wants to get closer to that idea of normal. But um, my deaf friends, if you told them, I'll, I can give you a pill and tomorrow morning you're going to be hearing, they would not want to do it. They would not want to be hearing because that's not part of who they are. Just like. Um, hearing people would not want to be deaf tomorrow, then I wouldn't be Amy Anderson. Because mm. Amy Anderson, my, part of my identity is the fact that I'm hearing. So um, my deaf friends embrace their deafness, the culture, the language, the community it gives them. Um, and that's when my students can understand that, that's when they fall in love with ASL. Speaking of falling in love, how much do you love what you do every day? I love it. I tell my students, if I won the lottery tomorrow, you'd still be stuck with me. I'm still coming really? in every day. Oh, I, it's, it's part of me. It's you're part of my says, identity. You're not going to say, I'm done. No. I got the cash. I'm out. No, then I wouldn't be me anymore. It wouldn't be me. And the moment I remember, um, it was during my internship at the Maryland School for the Deaf, and I had a third grade class and was teaching. And all of a sudden, I just stopped and thought, I get to do this for the rest of my life. Wow. And I do, I do. Final question, what does it mean to you to have that, I know we got a shot of that team, that medal on your um, beautiful dress that basically just says, Amy Anderson, 2017, 2018, New Jersey State Teacher of the Year. Folks at the NJA, a lot of folks think that you're special. You say what? I say I represent all of the special teachers throughout New Jersey. We are always one, two, or three in the nation in education. We have teachers all across the state who feel as I do, who would go into work every single day regardless of um, other opportunities. They love their students. They give all of themselves. And so to be able to represent that, what an honor and what a gift. For those of us who have uh, spent time as public school students, my father, his two sisters, so many relatives in our family, public school teachers, for our children who have gone through the public schools, uh, as parents, we say thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank, well you. thank you. We have the vice president of the NJA, Sean M. Spiller, is in the house. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see you, always. Uh, but the theme, right off the bat, the theme of this year's convention is all about social justice. Talk yes. to us about it. You know what, I think uh, we all recognize it's important for all of us to be fighting for helping communities, helping people. Uh, it's a, a buzzword sometimes nowadays, people using it, but I think at the core of what we stand for, unionism is about, uh, at the core of what our members do with education, it's about helping people. It's about giving people a shot at that American dream, I always like to say, and uh, that's social justice, making sure everyone has that chance, everyone mm -hmm. has that opportunity making something more fair. That's what this is about. You and I have had conversations before um, to fully disclose our younger children <laughs> in the public schools in Montclair, a town you know very well. I know right? well, yes. Uh, you have a role there in Montclair? Uh, councilman in Montclair. Yeah. My councilman. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, here's what I'm curious about. Education in your life, teachers in your life, growing up. Describe so, it. so, so important and impactful. Uh, I always uh, share with people that you know, your parents, I think, are some of the most impactful people in your lives. Uh, but beyond that, it's, a, it's usually an educator uh, or somebody in that role, whether it be formal education or uh, some people it's a coach, some people it's another mentor. But uh, for me, yeah, there were so many along the way. Many can, or a few? Uh, for me, I'd say I can think of three that, that and, and the reason I think of it that way, I became a, a science teacher. And Was uh, there, a, excuse me, Frank Robinson, was there a science teacher who really connected with you? 
And that's why I came up with that number because as I thought back to it, they were all science <laughs> teachers. So I think absolutely, you know, that, that, that's grades? absolutely the case. Uh, high school, uh, college, and before that was, I guess, also high school, right as I was going really? in. Really? So yeah, and, and it, was, it was something where I always looked to them as, as an inspiration. I always, you know, just loved being in their classes. And, you know, when it was even in college, just loved to, you know, have a relationship with them as much as I could. You know, it's your formative years. Uh, but for me, it really made a lot, a lot of difference. So, yeah. What did you see in them more specifically? I saw them truly, uh, hard to describe it now because uh, you know, you're looking back on it and you know they were making a difference. So it's easy for me now to say I saw them making a difference. And, and, but I really understood what they meant to me. You know, I, I didn't really know more broadly, but, but for me, I just felt that they, they, they knew how important I was. Uh, they respected me and, and wanted me to learn and were excited when I understood something. And for me, uh, it just felt good as a kid. Mm. That's what I knew and understood. But, but I think that lasting impression, as I look back, now I realize it was just making a difference. Talking about making a difference, one of the things Sean does in his role as vice president, he currently hosts a terrific series called Classroom Close-Up. It can be seen on NJTV, our partners, our sister station, if you will, our presenting station. You host that show. It's won how many Emmys? 15, I believe, 15 Emmy Awards. Marie Blister is very proud of that. She's a big part of winning a lot of those Emmys, but it, the, the previous, previous host. That's the previous right. Host, well, we, actually, yeah. Marie's off camera. She'll be listening <laughs> in a second. What's it like for you to host Classroom Close-Up? By the way, check it out so you can see some back editions of it. Go ahead. It has been awesome. Awesome. I have to tell you, I, I knew it would be exciting, and I had an opportunity to see Marie at some of the different things that she had done along the way, but for me, to kind of get out there and see these things that the kids Explain are doing. Explain to folks, I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, Explain to folks what the premise of Classroom Close-Up is. Classroom Close-Up goes throughout the state and really just highlighting some of the wonderful things that our kids are doing, our educators are doing, our schools are doing. And you travel the whole state. I have the opportunity now as, as we film the show to just see what's happening, you know, from north to south, east to west, things that I never knew and, and some things that I never experienced when I went to school. But I, I, I look at it and say, wow, these are, this is phenomenal and the kids are loving it. Uh, 2018, New Jersey, there is a new governor. Yes, there is. There is a reconstituted, let's say, state legislative leadership on some, one half of the House, uh, two houses, if you will. Number one agenda item you say on behalf of the teachers in this state is? Well, I think on behalf of all of us as educators, we want to make sure that our schools get the support that we need. Uh, I think every educator will tell you, yes, it's about making sure we've got the proper funding uh, in a lot of our districts that have been underfunded for so many years. We need the resources to connect with every kid, to give every kid that opportunity, that social justice that we're talking about. We also know that it means when you make a commitment to individuals, whether it be pensions or all these other pieces, you have to honor those. That's things that we teach kids at a very early age. And we also know at the end of it, you can't tell somebody this is the most important profession in the world mm -hmm. and we're going to pay you less every year to do it. We've got to solve that problem as well for the sake of our profession. One to ten, how much you love what you do as an educator? Eleven. No doubt? No doubt. No doubt. To watch more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. This gentleman is changing a lot here at the convention. He's Rich Kiker, founder and CEO of Kiker Learning. Rich, you're talking about Google down here because? I am, Steve. Thank you. Uh, you know, we're doing a lot of work. I had the, the benefit to work with about 150 educators here, uh, a special event, helping those 150 New Jersey educators get Google certified. What does that mean, Google certified? You know, it, it has a lot of value in education right now. Teachers, of course, can use it for practical reasons. They can use it as evidence of their professional development for their, for their evaluations. But what we're really seeing here is just uh, hunger, uh, a desire by these educators to connect their kids with the latest technologies and give them these skills that are meaningful for what they're going to be doing after they leave their K-12 institutions. Give us, give us an example of how it would actually work in the classroom. For example, Google has recently released, in, within the last couple of years, something called Google Classroom. What is it? Google Classroom. Google Classroom. It's a product that works in the G Suite for Education platform. It is a product that allows teachers to quickly deliver information to students, quickly collaborate with students, accept projects and assignments in a much quicker fashion than they were able to do in the past, and allows them to kind of deliver rich media and new content through this kind of closed platform that protects kids within, within Google Classroom. So a teacher can move from the traditional instruction of, um, you know, this is what we're gonna do today, guys, to, okay, here's what we're gonna do today. 
here is a resource for you that includes a video, that includes an animation or a simulation. It's all curated and available to this class within Google Classroom, and it frees that teacher up to be kind of the master of the space to move around, mm -hmm. connect with kids, and have a more dynamic, interactive, and inviting classroom working with those kids one-on-one. -on -one. What kind of reaction you get from, this to, from the teachers? Thanks and, and happiness, uh, when maybe we should be giving it to them. You know what? Teachers will be the first one, as a former teacher, teachers will be the first one to tell you that they are the most difficult audience because they're critical of what they're seeing, <laughs> right? Are they really tough? They are, they are tough until you give them something valuable and then you've made a friend for life. You actually refer to this as the whole Google thing we're talking about as some sort of industrial, the next industrial revolution. What do you mean by that? You know, it, it's sometimes hard, hard to explain, but you think about the first industrial revolution, education became what it is now to prepare students for the workforce that the industrial revolution gave us. Now with the information age and access to information and new industries sparring from the internet at all times, the skills have changed. We're focused on more of those critical thinking, those collaboration, the ability for kids to have growth mindsets and think on their feet. So schools have to shift. Schools and teachers are now focused on how do we give them those skills to thrive in this modern economy, in this modern society? How do they serve and solve the problems that are facing them with more relative skill sets? Mm. So because the world's shifting so quickly, our classrooms are shifting quickly. That's a major disruption. It's hard for our schools to adapt that fast. But again, as evidence here, these teachers understand that. They're coming to these events, they're doing the hard work, and they're doing amazing things for these kids to give them these skills. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by Wells Fargo, Caldwell University, Hackensack Meridian Health, New Jersey Sharing Network, Community Food Bank of New Jersey, the Northward Center, and by NJM Insurance Group. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Perfectly orchestrated. In sync with your life. Hackensack Meridian Health is redefining how health and care come together. Because when everything works together, your world gets better. Hackensack Meridian Health, life years ahead.